You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, The Voice, Jeff Tucker. All right, can you feel it? Can you hear it in the wind? Not Scary Farm is over. It ended Saturday night, November 1st. And I was, uh, because I went to Kamikaze, I was up 21 or 22 hours before I finally went to bed. And I don't even remember much of Sunday because I was awake and not, awake and not, and completely out of it. <clears throat> but uh, it was great. Kamikaze was great. We had a great time. And uh, it's weird because for a, a con that started off being, you know, just a small con especially compared to comic-con we were stunned at how busy it was uh there were moments where you couldn't move down the aisles and it was weird too because the most popular booth there was line a new online uh phone app for communication and stuff and they were handing out look like impressive freebies but you know come on guys uh, that's nothing to do with a con. And they had other booths. They had a guy doing back massagers with a little machine. They had a woman doing palm readings. And it was weird. All these uh, booths had nothing to do with the, you know, pop culture. And in the far side, they had plenty of room for more booths. They had a whole area taken up with Spider-Man basketball. Spider, is that a thing? Do people watch that? Spider-Man and Deadpool playing basketball? I that I, I don't have time for that. That's ridiculous. But they did have something that the other that, that Comic-Con uh, simply can't have because of the amount of uh, dealers and exhibitors packed into their floor. They had cars on display. They had Kit. They had the Jurassic Park Jeep. And they also had the Back to the Future DeLorean. And they were there to pr- promote some new... Uh, Hollywood prop museum they want to build so I was dressed as Marty McFly and I walked up to the car and the guy's like hey five dollars do you want to take a picture with the car I said dude what do you think I'm dressed as Marty McFly of course I want to donate to your 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 cause here and take a picture in the car so that's pretty much what I bought and then I found a guy who had those uh, new Funko reaction figures which I'm completely and totally obsessed with and I was able to find Mia Wallace from Pulp Fiction. And this is a dangerous set of toys. If you've listened to the other shows, you know that I am a I love collecting toys. And the problem with the Funko toys is that they launched with so many different lines and three or four figures sometimes of each that I'm never going to catch up. You know, do I go... Now, I had data from Goonies, so do I go with Sloth or Chunk or Mikey or Mouth? But no, I never, had not seen the Pulp Fiction ones. And I want, you know, Mia Wallace, it's cool. It looks like my wife. I got to have it. So I'm hoping that this problem continues. I'm hoping that Funko picks up a ton of more licenses. I'd love to see uh, Blade Runner, Labyrinth, Fifth Element, uh, Breakfast Club, uh, Weird Science. I mean, they could pick up almost any license in the vintage Kenner style and just crank those suckers out. They're finally getting a uh, Alien Series 2, which is very cool. Uh, I can't wait to get that because they, they, they've got a Ripley in their space suit from the climax of the movie. And I'm also hoping that Back to the Future warrants a second series. And it would be great to have <clears throat> Lorraine and... Uh, some of the other characters from part one that aren't you know part of the series but it'd even be even better obviously to have part two with marty in his 2015 with the hoverboard and the the expandable jacket and doc in his cool coat with the silver glasses and griff i mean the back to the future series could have so many cool figures so i'm hoping i'm hoping i'm hoping that they continue uh that's to me and you know we've had 15 17 years of companies trying to up the ante as far as sculpting goes and raising the price of figures to 20 22 24 27 dollars and finally here's a 9.99 which is still a little pricey but i'm willing to pay it because i'm willing to support a line that's so uh unique you know you go back to that vintage kenner style and it's a little rudimentary but it's very nostalgic and it's 
and it it just reminds me of this it, it's fake nostalgia it's what if they had had these toys when i was a kid and i would have bought them now you know like i've said before i waited 29 years for back to the future figures so uh any license they pick up i'm going to support and any um I'm going to buy them all, except, you know, there's a couple I won't buy. Like, I'm not into Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I like some of the Firefly figures, but the Captain Reynolds figure looks... I know they're not supposed to look like exactly who they're doing, but it doesn't even look anything close to anything on the show. It needs a coat, and I know they did the they did Captain Reynolds' coat as an exclusive, but come on, guys. You did a coat for Kyle Reese. You got to do a coat for Nathan Fillion. And I'm not a big fan of some of the Terminator ones. The endoskeleton, most of the ones I've seen in the package are broke. And that's not a good sign. Uh, both the chrome and the flat version. And the um, the actual Terminator one, I, I don't know what that's supposed to be. So maybe they'll end up doing Terminator 2 where he's half, you know, half damaged, half not. And they can really uh, nail some of that license. That it couldn't be any worse than the awful figures for Terminator Salvation. If you want to see one of the worst toy lines ever, there you go. Uh, they didn't even get likeness rights for uh, Christian Bale. So the John Connor figure is wearing a bandana and sunglasses. He looks like he's going to rob a bank. It's the dumbest thing you've ever seen. Don't if, you're not, if you can't make it even close, don't bother. Don't even make the figure. Why are you wasting our time? I mean, those Terminator toys clogged the aisles for at least a year after the film's release. Not the worst I've seen. In the last uh, decade or so, the worst toys uh, to, to, to rot on the shelves were the 2003 Ang Lee Hulk toys. I bet you could go to Toys R Us and still find some of that crap. Boy, did they misjudge all that. And you know, they actually made a figure of, or it was a two-pack, of the demon dogs from the end of the movie. The demon dogs, really, the mutant poodle figures. Who wants that? Not me, not me. Well, anyways, this is uh, 91 Reasons. I am the voice. I am Jeff Tucker. I am who you're listening to. God bless you for downloading. And I've looked at some of the episodes I've done over the past few weeks, and I don't know if it was Halloween Haunt and working these crazy, insane hours that uh, made me nostalgic. Probably more closer to the truth is simply that working those hours i didn't have time to watch any movies i would get home and i would just be like dead i would have to pour myself into bed and then be awoken like like uncovering king tut's tomb and stumble out into the sunlight blinking and holding my hand to shield me from the rays so i just haven't had time i started to watch last action hero during the run because i was going to do a show on that because you know i love um movies that bombed that may might not be as bad as you remember and last action hero is a bad movie but it has good spots and it has an interesting story but i didn't get to finish it because again i'm just too exhausted but i did watch a movie just last night i was up till one trying to wean myself off of these incredibly late hours that i've been working and i took in the matrix and uh Man, what a cool movie The Matrix is. E even now, it's still a cool movie. And you know what? It, it's one of those movies that, like Tron, I think it gets better with age. Because once the initial shock wears off of what you're looking at, you can slow down and actually enjoy the story and not worry about when the next action sequence is coming up. And The Matrix benefits from being uh, released in the early early popularity of the internet the internet was just starting to come into its own when it came out late march 1999 so people were still a little you know the, the people were still using the word cyberspace and surfing the net and using geo cities right <laughs> and uh but if you watch it now like not only does the effects still hold up but the terminology and the internet and a lot of the stuff that they were using that seemed crazy at the time now seems so commonplace and so matter of fact that I think uh, I enjoyed it uh, just as much last night as I did seeing it in the theater now of course uh, 
the ad campaign didn't really tell you what the movie was about. It was another successful campaign where they held back what is the matrix, you know, and, and going in, it was like, well, what is the matrix? It's the name of the movie, but what is the matrix? So I am happy to report that when I went into the theater to go see the matrix, I didn't know what the plot was. I really had no idea. I had seen a couple of the commercials and the trailer, but I didn't know exactly what the uh, plot was. And movies like this really get me excited. Like I really, if, if the script takes a turn that I wasn't expecting and then successfully builds to a climax that makes sense, I mean, this is exactly why you're going. You know, I, if you go into Back to the Future not knowing what it's about, you're not certain what's going to happen when Marty jumps into the DeLorean and suddenly he's in 1955. You know, what is he going to do? And The Matrix is uh, another one of those. You know, there's a whole bunch of them. Fight Club, uh, The Game, The Sixth Sense, uh, really well-made quality movies that manage to surprise you that they're not just cookie cutter movies made to, you know, you know, it's easy to just sit down and do uh, genre picks that are high concept, you know, um, you could, you could rattle them off. You know, I, I'm trying to come up with, uh, some examples like kids find treasure map goonies you know they save their house you can do the byline in just a sentence or a sentence and a half um guy gets shrunk injected in human body uh that's either fantastic voyage or inner space uh rock and roll vampires the lost boys uh, but then there are movies that come along that defy that you know you cannot give a one sentence byline for the abyss it's way too complicated and it's way too rich and rewarding for that the matrix even even a movie like who framed roger rabbit doesn't get a a, a one by you know uh rabbit gets framed for murder well that's not really what the movie's about is it uh so these movies that that try harder and gosh was it 1999 a good year for movies it's hard to it's hard to look back and and, and not be impressed by the slate of movies that came out and early in the year, we got Matrix. You know, this was not a late summer release. It feels like a late summer release when you're watching it. But this movie, because Phantom Menace was coming out on Memorial Day, they needed to get the Matrix out early because they knew they had something a little different. Now, it wasn't so different for those of us who the year before went and saw a fantastic movie called Dark City. Now, Dark City and The Matrix are pretty much the same movie. And I bet a lot of you have never even heard of Dark City. Now, the film aficionados, it's, it's, it holds a place of honor on, on your shelf. And I've watched Dark City a dozen times and even watched it with the God Rest His Soul Roger Ebert uh, commentary. And Dark City's really cool movie. Uh, see if this sounds familiar. Uh, a guy finds himself in the, met the metropolitan city. Strange things are happening that he cannot explain that are either supernatural or he's losing his mind. And in the case of Dark City, he's framed for murder. And everybody's looking for him. And in the end, it turns out that instead of computers, it's aliens that are manipulating a city and trying to to goad humanity into becoming something better. And this guy is able to, at the end, change reality with the wave of his hand. I mean, that's the plot of The Matrix. And do you know, I even read somewhere that The Matrix was filmed in uh, either New Zealand or Australia. I think it was Australia. And they used the same sets as Dark City. I mean, they're already built. Why not use them? And uh, boy, Dark City is a cool movie. If you've not, if you've not seen Dark City... You should look it up. You could probably get it on eBay for $2. Or it might be on Netflix. I don't know. But it's worth picking up the disc for that Roger Ebert commentary. And I think when I bought it, it was, it was really cheap even back in the day. It was never a prestige release, you know. But uh, it, does, it does have a special place on my shelf. And so, even though I'd seen Dark City, I didn't know The Matrix was going to uh, belong in the same uh, holding pin as 
Dark City, uh, but uh, it, it does. And <clears throat> boy, The Matrix opens with a bang. And it's weird to look at it. It's one thing to see it blind because when I saw it blind, I didn't know what I what was going to happen. I was shocked. But when you see it, knowing what's going to happen and what The Matrix is, the movie's actually better. It, it's great being in the dark. It's great feeling your way and discovering things along the journey. But The Matrix is a movie that certainly benefits from not only multiple viewings, but multiple viewings with heavy scrutiny. Watch this movie. Watch it again. Because I know you've seen it. Everybody's seen The Matrix. But watch it again and notice how in the first scene, uh, well, it's in the dark, and we're listening to a phone call through The Matrix. Uh, and phones are the central theme of the movie. And we get um, this this fragmented conversation that Trinity has been watching Neo, watching the Keanu Reeves character. And she gets caught by the police at the heart of the city motel. And when it opens, it, you're not really sure who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. Is she a superhero? Is she an alien? We don't know because she moves faster than anything we've ever seen. She's dodging bullets. She's fighting. She's running. When she runs up the wall and when she does that sort of crane move in the air and the camera moves around, that's when you know that the, the Wachowski brothers who directed this are about to unleash something new. And how many times... Do we get to see something new when we go to the movies? So often we go to movies because they're familiar. You know, oh, it's the fourth Transformers movie. I'm familiar with that. Oh, it's the it, coming up. It's going to be the seventh Star Wars movie. I'm familiar with that. Oh, it's the 27,000th Penguin of Madagascar's movie. But it's a better feeling when you're given something new and when the can when when she goes up into that crane move and the camera moves around a little it back in 1999 startling and when she runs up the wall like you're just not certain what her deal is they have that great rooftop chase and like any good magic trick and the matrix is almost a magic trick you start off slow and you build so that each progressive miracle impresses the audience even more so when she jumps across the roof it's not a big deal and then she does that big jump across the roof and the agent follows her now you know that not only is she something different but these agents are because they've already told the police your men are already dead and the chase is on now i will give you that because it's 99 some of the effects are a little wonky the shot of her uh, free falling through the air to get into the window looks a little silly, but I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, a movie this good is allowed a few minor discrepancies, and they are minor discrepancies. They would save all of their big discrepancies for the two unnecessary sequels, Reloaded and Revolutions. But the first movie gets it all right. Because at the end of the chase, it ends with a bang, too. She calls for an exit. She gets to the phone, and the truck slams into it, and she's gone. Now, all the elements are there that later on in the movie, we will come to know. That they're moving in and out of the Matrix through phones, both using cell phones to communicate and hardwired phones to get out of the Matrix. But we don't know that at the beginning, and all we're treated to is this film noir 1940s city which is again reminiscent of dark city and strange things are going on and a lot of times movies like this will introduce these elements and then gloss over them later but the matrix if you hang on till the end is going to give you all the answers to this craziness and all the answers thank god make sense and that's why it's so good. That's why subliminally your brain knows that you're looking at a well-crafted movie that started with a well-crafted script and pro progressed through whatever. How This movie took at least a year or longer to film, I know, with months and months of kung fu training for everybody involved. And it did signal the arrival of uh, wire foo, which has been used in... Uh, 
Asian cinema for years where the actors are on wires and they're doing things that are out of control. And a lot of the Asian movies, that's just the way they fight. That hyper, that's just the way they fight, right? And even at the beginning, watch as uh, Trinity moves through. And every time she moves, you hear like a, a, and that's supposed to let you know that she's moving faster than the other guys. But in the Matrix, the wire foo is actually explained. It's actually given a reason why it's there. They're defying the gravity of the Matrix. And that's why it's so good, because you're blown away at how logical everything is. Okay, so the, the chase ends, and then we're introduced to Neo, or Tom Anderson. And uh, I was impressed watching it last night, because... The scene where he's woken up by the computer talking to him. It's Trinity talking to him through the computer. They're they're slowly giving him breadcrumbs that he'll take one at a time. And they're preparing him uh, to leave the Matrix. So it's got to be done delicately, right? It has to be done as if it's his choice to leave the Matrix. They're not pulling him out. He is raising his hand and saying, I am volunteering to leave. And that's the same journey that he'll go on later when he becomes the one. They, they, I'll get to that, because they don't tell him he's the one. Morpheus believes it. Neo does not. And the Oracle tells him he isn't. But we'll get to that. Uh, but look at the scene where the guy comes to the door to buy. You think it's drugs, and it turns out it's some computer program to do something and isn't it funny that his computer monitor is as big as a, an RV and he's using uh, he's handing him a disc like there's no wireless download they really nailed 1999 technology to a T you know and, and even added in all the 40s stuff because they're still using rotary phones and really complicated cyberpunk guns and, and machinery but look at the scene where the where the guy's at the door. The first thing he tells him is that uh, you're my you're my lifesaver. Oh, my own pers- you're my own personal Jesus. Like that's almost the first line that somebody says to Neo in the movie. That's dialogue. He's they're 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 almost on a loudspeaker letting you know that Neo is Jesus. He's the guy that's coming to save the world from its own sins. And boy, does it get hammered over your head. But it's done so subtle that if you don't know the twist, if you don't know what's coming, it doesn't feel like, it just feels like dialogue. It's almost the same technique they used in early seasons of Dexter, if you're a fan of that show, where he would tell people who, who, what kind of monster he was, but it was always under the context of a different kind of conversation. But it's interesting in that scene that... Uh, you're my lifesaver. Uh, you're the one. You're the, my own personal Jesus. Like it's it's really funny how it's all done. And uh, boy, let me ask you. Let me just digress for a minute. Did that girl who plays the white rabbit, you know, with the tattoo on her neck, did she ever work again? Man, that that's a a really attractive woman. Did she not ever do another movie? I should IMDb her. You know, she she must she should have done a hundred movies after that. And what guy watching the movie wasn't like, this girl wants you to go, you're going to go. So, of course, he goes. And it's it's funny uh, knowing later on, because the, the Wachowski brothers, uh, as far as what they had done Bound before this, I'm sure they did something else, but I know they had written and directed Bound, which is a really cool movie with Gina Gershon, Jennifer Tilly, and Joe Pantoliano, or Joey Pants. But... Uh, we didn't quite know their deal. So the aesthetic of the movie feels like something that... Did a team come up with it? What was the look? But we would know after uh, Reloaded that uh, the Wachowski brothers are very freaky. They're very into fetish. Everybody in the movie is in black patent leather or rubber or some sort of fetish gear. Like every every time they they assume their matrix personas and look at the club scene like everybody's dressed like that this is the height of fashion and we know that um uh, one of the wachowski brothers who um uh had surgery to change genders you know god god bless her for living their life that way you know that's very brave um but they're also into some other stuff right on top of that and the movie does 
subtly hint at it. It's it's much more blatant in the sequels, uh, but we're not talking about that crap right now. We're talking about the masterpiece that is the first movie. But at the club, you know, he meets Trinity and he knows her as a hacker who once hacked the IRS. So they're giving a little bit of history and they're talking about Morpheus, that he's this legendary worldwide hacker. And there was a hint on the computer earlier that Neo was looking him up. So Neo has been aggressively in his private life trying to find Morpheus so that Morpheus will tell him what the Matrix is because he just wants to know. And again, that goes towards the story arc of this movie as far as Neo is concerned in that he's the reluctant hero, but he's also the yearning hero. He wants to do this. He wants to know the truth, even though he's scared that the truth is going to be something he can't handle. And he's going to take that step, right? So at the club, he um, he knows he's going to uh, some at some point make contact with Morpheus. But uh, we don't find out until the next day when he's late for work and he's in his cubicle. And look at um, the scene with his boss who's yelling at him for being late. But he's also, again reinforcing the fact that neo is or or tom is not part of the world you know you don't he basically tells him you don't think the rules apply to you and what does morpheus tell him over and over the rules do not apply to you neo you can when you figure out what you're capable of you won't have to do anything but whatever you want and it's, it's stressed again and again at the beginning of this movie. And it's so cleverly done. The boss scene's great. He's being bitched at, but he's also being told, you don't think the rules don't apply to you. And, to, and Neo, Tom, is just, he, he wants to get to work. He doesn't want to get to work. He doesn't believe it. He does believe it. We're torn. And the sequence where he gets the phone via the FedEx envelope, uh, what a great set piece and it is a set piece uh it doesn't have over the top action we've had one tiny fight scene and base at the beginning and then the movie slows way down because even though the action sequences are what people remember they're actually not a very big part of the matrix and that's because oh we'll go back to the old filmmakers adage because they didn't have enough money Yes, The Matrix is an expensive movie. Very expensive movie. But the the money's all up on the screen. And as expensive as bullet time was, they didn't have money for a lot of other things. They saved it all for the end. And haven't I said in the Star Wars episode and a few other episodes, filmmakers are at their best when they have to be clever. Michael Bay just throws it all on the screen. Whatever mess he thinks up, it's on the screen. And it's so much better when they have to stop and sit down at a table and go, how are we going to do this within our means? Because you get great filmmaking out of it. And that's what we want. We don't want over-the-top spectacle all the time. What we want is great stories with good action sequences that complement that story that makes sense within that story, that it's not just every 15 pages an action sequence. That's boring. So I count this really cool set piece as just that. It's a really involved and interesting chase through the cubicles with with Morpheus on the phone telling Neo where to go and Neo for the first time putting his trust in Morpheus that he's leading him to salvation. Of course, salvation happens to be the window washer rig out the window. And it's funny, too, because watch the sequence with the boss yelling at him. Tom keeps looking at the window wiper. Like, is there some symbolism here of he's slowly having his world revealed? You know, it's hazy and wet. The sque- the squeegee comes, and we're getting glimpses at the truth now and again. But it's also to foreshadow the window washer rig when he's going to need it later. So it's not just there when he needs it. We've seen it before. And that's, again, that's just good storytelling. But of course he doesn't take it. And in uh, a really cool moment, he looks at the outside window. Actually, he goes out and he, he drops the phone. And the next shot, he's in handcuffs being led away by the agents. It's a, a really quick 
way to get that information across. And I listened to the Hollywood Saloon where John talked about shoe leather. And the movie doesn't have any shoe leather. Shoe leather is a guy gets in a car to go to work. You show him walking to the car. He gets in the car. He drives to work. He gets out of the car. He parks the car. He walks to work. He goes to his office. That's all shoe leather. That's filler. Good filmmakers just show him getting, he's at work. We don't, we know how he got there because we all drive to work every day. So you don't need to put that in there. And then this, the, the interrogation sequence is fantastic because again, we're telegraphing the plot of the movie when agent Smith says, uh, you are seem to be living two lives. One of them, you are Tom Anderson, a software designer. The other, you are Neo, a hacker. One of these lives has a future. And you know what? That's the plot of the movie. He is leading two lives and the Tom Anderson life is about to cease. And the other one, Neo, the hacker persona, is going to have a future. Smith is telling you the plot of the movie. But again, we're not privy at this point to what the Matrix is. And we're still uncertain as to what the plot of the movie is. Is it, is it going to be some sort of cyber terrorist movie? Where people on computers are taking down the system? What is it? And again, just when you think you've got it figured out, when he flips him off and demands his phone call, Agent Smith looks at him and says, what will you need with a phone call when you can't speak? And then Tom's mouth melts. And this is the first supernatural for real scene in the movie. What the hell is going on? Is he on drugs? Is everybody on drugs? Is it another planet? Are these guys supernatural? We, we don't know. We don't know. And it's really scary scene when they take his mouth away because then they put that bug in his chest. And what's really cool about the sequence is that it ends with him waking up in bed. And it does put a little bit of doubt as to whether it actually happened. Did it happen? I don't know. Well, what's going on? I don't know. And what's great is they don't leave you in the dark for very long because he gets a call from Trinity that they got to meet him right now. And the next shot after that is beautiful. Look at that shot of Neo waiting in the tunnel, the over the underpass, the overpass. And look at the water coming down on the other end. It's coming down like a waterfall. Like the Wachowskis were not happy with the rain machine. They wanted the waterfall machine. And it's such a beautiful shot. And then that... Cadillac pulls up with the suicide doors and he gets in, he's held at gunpoint. Like it's all again, very film noir. Like it's um almost the Nighthawks painting come to life. Uh, if you've ever seen Nighthawks, the painting of the people at the diner, you know, just the desolation, the um the uh, isolation of being in a big city full of people and still feeling alone and tortured. And this guy, Tom is just desperate to connect with somebody like he has a crappy job. He doesn't like he's into some hacking stuff on the side. That's very, very illegal. Now he's in trouble with the law and he's just, he's just trying to find answers like everybody else is. And he feels so isolated and alone that he's going to just go with these people and when he gets in the car and is held at gunpoint, like any rational person, when they go, it's our way or the highway, would have just got out of the car. You know, if you get in a car full of friends or, you know, friends in quotes, and they pull a gun on you, it, we're not friends. It's time to go. And then uh, Trinity talks him off the ledge. And what follows is confirmation that everything we've seen has actually happened. When they pull the bug out of his stomach, we're still not clear what the hell's going on. And when it turns back into the little diode, we're, we're very uh, confused. But it does let us know that there's something going on in the city much bigger than we've been led on to believe. There is forces against Tom and against civilization that they're going to have to fight. So it's not about high hacking at this point. This is a revolution movie. This is the rebellion fighting the empire. And what they've done is they've recruited Neo to join this army. So when they take him to see Morpheus, 
really, really grand scene. And it's just two guys talking in a room. Two guys talking with uh, in wingback chairs. And Morpheus, and you know what? I, I've never been a real Lawrence Fishburne fan. You know, yeah, he was great as Cowboy Curtis on Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I enjoyed King of New York. And he's done some good movies, but he was never really on my radar. I'm sure like a lot of people. But as Morpheus, he is fantastic. And Keanu Reeves is fantastic. And Carrie Ann Moss's Trinity is so good that she had a tough time finding work after The Matrix uh, ended, all three sequels. Yeah, she was in uh, Memento, which is fantastic, but not so much after that because it's hard to look at her and not go, that's Trinity, because she's so good at it. Uh, but, but this whole sequence really belongs to Lawrence Fishburne because his Morpheus is... He's the Obi-Wan Kenobi of this journey. He's the elder Jedi who's going to not only recruit Neo and train him, but help him face uh, the final battle at the end, right? Uh, but that sequence is really good, really well done. And when uh, he's offered the red pill or the blue pill, we know he's going to take the blue one because he wants to know what's going to happen. You know, we, the audience, want to know as badly as he does. So we know what pill he's going to take. But I'm telling you, when I saw this in the theater, I was still in the dark. When they sit him down with all those electrodes on and Joey Pants, Cypher, says, uh, you better hold on, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. I don't know what's going to happen. And I, I was really excited because... Again, most movies are cookie cutter, and you know exactly what's going to happen. So when he looks over and the mirror heals itself, and he goes, did anybody else see that? And then there's almost as if um, he ceased to be in the room for a moment. And when the mirror gloms onto his hand and then goes up his arm and into his mouth, I, I don't know what the hell is going on because... Not only did they reference the White Rabbit and Alice in Wonderland, but now he's literally going through the looking glass. You know, these are not subtle metaphors, folks. <laughs> but uh, again, I, you're, you're lost. And I'm telling you, the last 30 years of cinema, there have been some really great reveals. I mentioned some earlier. When he wakes up in that pod with no hair, no eyebrows, covered in goop and tubes, you are shocked. Nobody saw that coming. And God, isn't it well done. That spider thing comes over and jettisons him, you know, unplugs him from the matrix and jettisons him down, basically the garbage chute. And when you know what the story's about, you start to think like, is this how we have our vision of hell? Like, did somebody get unplugged accidentally and come back? And this is why we, we have a vision of hell being such a bad place of torment and drowning and bodies. And, you know, they tell you later on it's glossed over. But do you know where Neo is going at that point? They say the sewer. But it's not the sewer, because later on, the Nebuchadnezzar is in the sewer, and they talk about how it's not used anymore. No, Neo gets flushed down into that water, that goop. Do you know what that is? That's where they send everybody. And when you die, you're liquefied. And the liquid is fed to the babies that are just now being plugged into the matrix three columns over. You know, that's heavy stuff. The circle of life in the Matrix is not pretty. And when they finally retrieve Neo, you know, the, the, the pill they gave him was to, it, it did two things. It was to put him into cardiac arrest so that he would be ejected from the Matrix. It also contained a trace program so that the Nebuchadnezzar could find out what pod he was in. Because when he looks out at that vast sea of all those red pods... And the bleakness that humanity has become, there was no way they were going to find him. This is a needle in a stack of needles. So the, the trace program is how they find him. And 
<laughs> I'll tell you, watching the this the movie on the big screen, I, I don't know. And they use the 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 same technique as Robocop, where he's fading in and fading out, and every time he fades in, he's moved a little farther down the line. You know, for Robocop, he's slowly becoming more of Robocop, but in this one, he's becoming more human. So it's the opposite. And you know, again, the 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 metaphor is not subtle. You know, if if Neo is Jesus. This is his first time he's died. He has been ejected from the only life he's known, the Matrix. He has been put into a fake death, and he has been resurrected by the Nebuchadnezzar and its crew, and now he's joined it. And they they do some really good science where they have to uh, use electricity to stimulate his muscles because he's never used them. He's never used his eyes. He has to grow his hair. This this movie, again, this movie took forever to make. And imagine what it was like plotting it out for a shooting schedule because you've got days where he has hair, days where he doesn't. They're all filmed out of sequence and you better get it right because pickups are going to be a bitch. Uh but uh, he's he's aboard the Nebuchadnezzar, and it, I I like these sequences because at the time they reminded me of Star Wars. You know, this is Han Solo, the Nebuchadnezzar is his Millennium Falcon, and they're going around picking up people and trying to save the universe. Um, and uh, you know, it, now you look back and it, it reminds you of Firefly, but there was no Firefly back then, so it was only uh, a Star Wars reference that you could make. But uh, you learn like life above the Nebuchadnezzar and how many people they've saved. And they make mention of Zion. And uh, you're never going to go to Zion in this movie. We'll, we'd go in the sequels and we'd find that uh, <laughs> not only was it crappy, but maybe it wasn't worth saving because they're not doing anything there of merit. Uh, but again, I don't want to get into that. We're just we're just talking about the first movie. But uh, life aboard the Nebuchadnezzar is great. And we learn that uh, there are some people that are petty and some people that aren't and there are earnest people and some people that were made organically and are not part of the matrix um but uh, and also we're taught how the system works how they s- sit in these chairs and they jack into the system and they're able to move about the matrix and the loading program where they can train and the science and the science fiction technology all feels really viable there's not there's hardly any leaps here and again that's why it's so good because it just feels like the matrix is a full complete workable universe and it's really good and we're treated to our first uh real world menace with the squids uh slowly hovering around looking for the nebuchadnezzar as they power down in the sewers um, it's very reminiscent of when Han parks the Falcon on the Star Destroyer. Um, so it's all familiar yet new and very good. And the designs are great. And you can tell that they're influenced by, you know, there's Sid Mead and um, Mobius and uh, a lot of really um, well thought out designs. I and mean, they're all insect like, which would make sense because they have to move about in different places. So. Uh, everything's very real and very good and uh, i really like the uh the training sequence or the upload sequence where well first we're treated to a history lesson in the loading program and again we're back to the two chairs and the really old tv because that looks familiar and neo is treated to the history of the fall of mankind by morpheus and it's all done very well and it's weird because we've already seen a sequence like this in Terminator, but we don't see the war. It's all just dialogue. They don't spend a lot of money. There's only a couple shots of the cityscape in ruins. You know, watch the movie. It feels bigger than it is because the acting is so well and the story is so uh, carefully thought out. And it has um, one of the most beautifully horrific scenes of almost any movie and that's the uh the baby harvesting scene where you see the the children being grown in pods and being plucked up by these giant machines which are 
encapsulating them in eggs and uh, taking them up through tubes and it culminates in the oh my god every cyberpunk's wet dream scene of the little baby with all the tubes in it and the clear liquid made from the dead seeping up and it's it's at 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 once beautiful gross amazing detestable um realistic uh fantasy and everything rolled into one and when Morpheus says that the reason they're doing it is, is that the human body gives off an electrical charge. I know that a lot of people debunk that, but he also says they're using body heat to power their machines. So if you don't buy the electrical charge reason, you have to buy the body heat seek, uh, reason because that's very, very viable. And it does explain why earlier uh, Switch called Neo Copper Top because then they show the Copper Top battery you know that's really cool sorry i'm drinking some coffee i'm losing my voice here i'm at the uh 40 minute plus mark already <clears throat> but uh then neo gets uh, uh uh uploaded with how to learn how to how to fight and what a great training sequence normally we get a montage where the hero learns how to use his lightsaber and the force or he trains with mr miyagi or a million other things or in team america a montage about a montage but in this they're using shorthand and the shorthand is uh like terminator it's being uploaded to his system how to how to use everything and uh it's very cool and who wouldn't want to spend 10 hours learning how to fight how to do everything cool and it just be innate in your brain you know that's the an easy way to learn everything so that um we get the next big sequence it's the next um set piece and that's the fight in the dojo between morpheus and neo and if you didn't think it was important the character's uh, have that moment home or that idea home by running to the monitors to watch you know uh, the little mouse guy goes uh, Morpheus is fighting Neo and they run because they want to see if Neo's the one and if Neo can beat Morpheus and it starts out light you know they're just sparring and by the end they're doing the wire foo and Neo n gets the better of him and has to stop himself from hitting him and he knows that Morpheus is just goading him. He's goading him into finding his potential, finding the power within him. You know, like any good teacher, he is challenging him to be better than he thinks he can be. Because he knows what's coming is the fight of all fights, and a fight that until this point, everybody has lost. You know, it's no joke when Cypher says, everybody who has faced an agent has died, or it's Morpheus that says that. It's Cypher that tells him, you just run, run, Forrest, run. And what's interesting is how long the Nebuchadnezzar portion of the movie lasts. Because for a movie that's about the Matrix, they haven't, they don't go in it for a while because they've got to set all this stuff up. They've got to get you ready for what's coming so that you'll believe it and you'll know what the stakes are. All of humanity is at stake. Everybody's been enslaved by the computer, by the machines. So it's going to be up to Neo to save the day. And he can't get distracted by the woman in red because she could turn into an agent. And when they finally do go back into the Matrix, uh, right before we get a quick scene of Cypher uh, eating steak. Well, it's actually before that, if you watch the scene, Cypher has is, is got the blueprints to the power station up on his monitor and he turns them off right when neo comes in because we've been hearing since nearly scene one that one of them is a traitor the agents only found out about neo's um potential because of the traitor and we're, we're treated to it right away it is cypher who's eating the steak and doesn't care that it's fake and wants to be put back into the matrix he wants his body delivered back to the power station put back with the tubes and he wants to wake up and not remember anything because he's had it you know he's been following morpheus around forever and watch that scene because it's immediately followed up with the scene where they're eating the gruel from the tube 
So I'm not sure what we're supposed to glean from that, except that maybe Cypher has a point. You know, maybe comfort and safety with the enemy that you know is better than comfort and safety in the great unknown. <laughs> not really, but you never know, right? But uh, finally, they're going to go back into the matrix. After all this talk about this and that, they're going back in. And look at that scene when they finally go back in where the camera's rotating between the matrix world with the phone and the Nebuchadnezzar ship where they're all in their seats. And it's done with no effects, just editing. Really, really cool sequence. Uh, fun. Like we're back in. And it's because Morpheus is taking Neo to see the Oracle because the Oracle in parentheses Yoda is going to tell him that he's the one to break the prophecy and that everybody has gone to see the Oracle even Trinity although we're never told until the very end what her prophecy was you know the chosen one and all are we hearing echoes of Harry Potter a little bit or every popular uh culture story of the last 20 years you're the chosen one you're the one who will bring balance to the force blah 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 right but this time it's okay because it's really good so they journey through the city and neo is struck by how different everything looks now that he has the knowledge of where he's really at and how weird everybody looks going about their slave lives as cogs in a giant machine that they're not even aware of. You know, it's a really cool scene. And just as a side note, before they get to the Oracle, what will come up later, and it's come up a couple of times, is the agents, the evil computer viruses, the programs, are able to take over anybody's body at a given moment. And it's subtly hinted at with people using cell phones now in 1999 cell phones were not an everyday item you know nowadays there are more self if you look online there's more cell phones than toilets in the world but at the time in 99 they were still pretty new and using them as a plot device was still pretty like oh not everybody has a I don't have a cell phone who has a cell phone but Maybe they were trying to make a point about how having a cell phone and being connected everywhere was going to somehow dehumanize you and you were going to willingly give yourself over to the machine. And boy, doesn't that, doesn't that feel so much more relevant today with your phone being used for Facebook and Twitter and taking pictures and Instagram and Tumblr and oh yeah, somewhere down the line it makes phone calls. But I really like the Oracle sequence, and I was uh, struck last night, really studying the movie. Um, Morpheus tells Neo early that no one can be told what the Matrix is. That if you just tell somebody, hey, you're a battery in a pod, and this whole world is a dream while you're lying there in goop, no one's going to believe you. You might as well tell them the Earth is flat. So... The only way people believe that the Matrix is real is they have to be awakened from it and shown firsthand. They have to go through hell. Now, if that's the case, we already know that everybody, save the two Tank and Dozer, everybody aboard the Nebuchadnezzar was unjacked from the Matrix at some point, right? That's how they know. Well, what does that say? And they do also make a point that Neo is the oldest guy to be jacked out of the Matrix. You know, it's the old Yoda line. He is too old, too old to begin the training. You know, it's the same tropes, right? But what does that tell you about when they get to the Oracle's apartment and she casually says about all the children, the ones floating the blocks, the one bending the spoon, there is no spoon. All those children are unjacked from the matrix that's the only reason they can do what they're doing so these poor kids these kids were offered the red and the blue pill by somebody aboard another nebuchadnezzar type ship with another crew now we'll meet them in part two 
But in part one, they're just sort of vaguely hinted at and no more relevant and and so than all these kids that are learning how to bend the rules of the matrix by floating objects, by bending spoons. So sometime in, in the history of these characters, they were given the choice. Now, some of those kids are really young. Do you think they knew what was going to happen? They didn't know. But do you think they understood the consequences of being told, once you take this pill, you can never go back to your old life? You know, I got kids who have trouble deciding what kind of ice cream to eat. Much less, if you take this pill, you're going to wake up in hell and then have to learn how to live all over again at age seven, eight, nine. That's hefty. And that's something I'd never even figured out until last night's viewing, really studying this movie. That's heavy, man. Great Scott is it heavy, to quote Doc Brown. <laughs> and Marty. And then the Oracle scene is interesting because we're all hoping that the woman is going to tell him he's the one so that he can just stop worrying and figure out how to save the world. But instead, we get that really cool moment with the vase. You know, would you have broken it had I mentioned it? And she tells him, in hindsight, what he needs to hear. He needs to be told he's not the one. Because, as Morpheus has said again and again, I'm going to show you a door, but you have to open it. And that goes with the oracle. If she tells him he's the one, he's not opening that door himself. The one can only be revealed can only find his way if he finds his way on his own you know he is left in the wilderness like in 300 and forced to come home to become a man the hero's journey and she says this is an interesting turn because she also says not only is he not the one but he's going to have to make a choice and the choice is going to be morpheus is going to give his life for him and what's interesting about that is that it happens in the movie not 15 minutes or less later in the film they don't make you wait till the end morpheus gives his life almost in the next scene because the next scene is where cypher is revealed to be not only the turncoat but he's going to murder everybody and give him morpheus because what the uh, what the matrix really wants are the shield codes to Zion and the location so they can destroy all the humans and put this rebellion to an end. Put everybody back in pods or kill them so that the machines can just go about doing the machine work of, of re-engineering the world without any headaches anymore. Right? And that's a really, really cool sequence because we're treated to a quasi action scene we get a fight in the bathroom again they're saving everything for the end which is i mean that's what movies are supposed to do you know you set up things you give them a few action sequences that are fun but you save the good stuff for the end because that's you know we're gonna end with a bang here it's called the finale for a reason right so the sequence in the bathroom is interesting because immediately morpheus knows they can't escape all, all of them at once. So he, he's going to stay behind and give everybody a chance to make it out. And you finally get to see Morpheus one-on-one -on -one with the agent. And, you know, like, like he said before, no one who's faced an agent has ever won. So we know Morpheus is not going to come out on top. He does get in a few shots, but the agent beats him bloody, right? But that sequence where Cypher shoots uh, Tank and Dozer and then is slowly uh, unplugging everybody man that's hard to watch because we're not sure how they're going to get out of it and when you when i first saw it the way they're talking you think that it's going to be a mystical moment like neo is going to wake up in both realms you know and he's going to um <clears throat> take out cypher physically on the nebuchadnezzar uh, but the dialogue is great because Cypher admits that he's in love with Trinity. He's been rebuffed. He wants out that Morpheus lied about everything. And you, you really feel his anger, you know, and part of it is not unjust. Like this guy's been led along for years in this crappy existence of the 
the, the true beat down underdogs. So when he gets shot, and even he can't believe it, that the guy's not dead, Tank is not dead, and Morpheus lives, it's like the prophecy is coming true. He says it, you know, if he's really the one, I couldn't possibly pull his plug, and guess what he doesn't? It's really cool. But it's not mystical yet. They're saving the mystical for the very end. And for all its bravado... It has good action sequences at the end, but the very we'll get to the very. I'm I'm racing ahead, right? But uh, they take Morpheus away, and we get a really fun sequence between Agent Smith and Morpheus, where Agent Smith's intentions are revealed. Like he just wants out. He hates humanity, and he hates assuming their form and having to live with them. And it's all very uh, dark and sinister and cruel, like really cruel. Um. But the Wachowskis finally get to play with all of the amazing ideas, concepts, and toys that they've introduced along the way. And it's not till the end that they finally get to use them all. When they go into the loading program and get all the guns, like that's a fun sequence of guns, lots of them. Boom, here they are, as many as you want. And the sequence in the... Uh, Lobby when they finally get back in the matrix and they mean business and they're just they're just taking everybody out, you know, and it's unfortunate that the the you know there is a Columbine connection to this where they tried to blame the Columbine massacre on this movie, um, and there are some eerie similarities, but the movie didn't make them do it, and I hate anybody who makes that connection. I'm only making it here to renounce it. Because I'm going to get back to the movie quick. Um, this just was an unfortunate bad timing of release and tragedy. And those two idiot monsters don't get to blame a movie for being for, for their insanity. And that's all I'm going to say on it. Um, but it's a really great action sequence. And the first really big action sequence of the movie. I mean, look at what we've seen so far. We've seen the Nebuchadnezzar flying around and avoiding. We've seen Trinity fight. We've seen a training program fight and some fun sequences, but no action. This is, I mean, this is almost what hour and 40 minutes in or at, at least. And we're finally getting the big action sequence and it does not disappoint. You know, they use all of the familiar tricks of ramping and stuff to really make it exciting and acrobatics. But we're not using true bullet time yet because Neo hasn't found his potential quite yet. Um, that will come a few minutes later when uh, they steal the helicopter. Trinity learns to fly it in an instant in a real, I mean, that what a great, plot device i need to learn how to fly that helicopter boom it's in your brain all right let's go that's i do that makes me so excited because it's so good um the sequence with uh the sky hook and they're being flown around like it's all very exciting i watched it again with a real um eye for detail and it all makes sense it's all fun um it reminds me of the the helicopter sequence in dark man if you've ever seen dark man um, but it's all great, and uh, there's there is CGI used, but it's not an overkill. You know, there really is two guys hanging from a helicopter in Australia. Um, uh, the helicopter crashes, and you get that cool rippling effect. And I don't know if that's the Matrix or the building or whatever, but it's cool. And the Neo starts dodging bullets on the rooftop and we finally get bullet time in all its glory. Like this is the money shot. And not only is it cool, not only is it eye popping and dazzling, but in the context of the story, it makes sense because Neo is now starting to understand that because the matrix is not reality, it can be bent. So he's seeing things differently. Trinity doesn't see bullet time. She just sees him dodging bullets like the, like the agents did. So it's just Neo that's seeing the bullet time and we the audience because we are following Neo's path. Uh, but it makes sense and it's fun and it's daring and it's exciting. 
and he risks his life to save Morpheus and to get him out of the Matrix. And it, look at this. It's not even until Morpheus picks up that phone do we actually ever even see the special effect of how they leave the Matrix and go back to the Nebuchadnezzar. The very end. They saved it to the end. You know, that's called using your effects budget wisely because they're going to spend it on the rest of the movie. Because the subway scene, the fight between him and Agent Smith, which starts out as a guy unsure of himself, and Neo slowly builds confidence, that's where all the money is spent. All the bullet time, all the ramping, all the dazzling special effects is in that fight. And it's not spaceships, it's two guys duking it out in a subway, and it's fantastic. You know, and all Smith is trying to do is kill him. And all Neo wants to do is prove that the agents can be stopped somehow. Now he's pummeling him, he's beating him, but it's not working. And the sequence progresses, and what's fun is inevitably, of course, we end up right back at the heart of the city motel where the movie began. This is where Trinity had her first face. Her first face off with the agents and it has to be where Neo will have his ultimate face off with the agents. But <clears throat> what's interesting is in a movie that has all these dazzling special effects, watch how the final sequence is just a guy running through a motel and through rooms and it's all done with really clever editing you know the agent turns into uh, from the old woman and throws the knife it's all just editing and we're not sure where the story is building but we're as shocked as neo is when he opens that door and agent smith shoots him in the chest like this is the end the agents have won the bad guys have won um, Neo is Neo is going to die and any illusion that he could survive that bullet is undone when Agent Smith just opens fire on him boom 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 right in the chest and Neo falls and it's a really interesting sequence because we finally get to hear Trinity's prophecy which is that she would only find true love with the one. And we discover, you know, she discovers long after we already knew, Neo is the one, she's in love with him, and we, we get redemption through love. And her kiss and her emotions and her need for Neo to save the day and be with her and not save her because she's saving him. He stands up and look at the agents. They're shocked. They're shocked as he stands up. And we finally get to see that Neo is the one because he looks up and we see the Matrix and how the Matrix is everywhere and everything. Everything is made of code, including the agents. And when they fire at him, Morpheus's prophecy comes true. When when. When Neo says, you mean I'll be able to dodge bullets? And Morpheus says, I'm saying that when the time comes, you won't have to. And Neo just stops the bullets. He is now a god. He is a god in the Matrix. He is the ghost in the machine. Now, I'm not a fan of how he undoes Agent Smith. The effect doesn't look very good. And I'm a little unclear. He jumps in and explodes him in a... A, a barrage of green sparks and I think Smith's face even flies by camera uh, it's a weird sequence um, I, I think that if they had more money or a little more time they could have done something a little better but <clears throat> from what we've seen the rest of the movie it's it's a, it's a forgivable o oversight you know not to have that be bigger you know it, it comes off a little um it looks like scanners. It looks like you ever see scanners where the guys are blowing everybody's heads up uh, with Michael Ironside, right? But uh, it's a great scene. And it's weird because after Neo 
finds out he's the one and has that really fun, almost yawn sequence where he's fighting the agents and then he kills Smith. Um, the movie uh, it has nowhere else to go. It, we're done. What's he going to do? Is he gonna, uh, going to unplug everyone? And we're not certain. And I think that when they when they started this film, I don't I don't think they had sequels in mind because if you have sequels in mind, you might have limited Neo's power because at the end we're right back to the beginning with the phone call, the brrr, the phone ringing, and now it's Neo talking directly to the Matrix saying, I don't know where we're headed, and I'm a little unsure. And then he flies off into the sky. It's a really fun moment. You know, it's a fun Superman of the new digital age moment. You know, and at the time this came out, Superman was dead. He wasn't coming back in a movie. It would take, what, uh, seven years later for Superman Returns. Um, but it's a great way to end the movie and it doesn't leave it open for much of a sequel, you know, and you can see in when, when I, if I ever talk about the sequels, they really didn't know where they were going because once you make a character, a God, what is there left to do? He can see the matrix. He can wave his hand and demolish cities. He can do anything. That's what a God is. He can remake it in his own. In Dark City, he floods the outer rim of the city to finally make the beach that they're all trying to get to. That he, you know, no one seems to know where it's at. Um, but uh, at the end of the Matrix, they just sort of ride off into the sunset. It's an interesting sequence, interesting way to leave, to leave the movie. I think, you know, for a movie that in-depth and that intricate, I think that we could have actually stomached 10 or 15 more minutes of Morpheus and Neo and the Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe they're going to Zion, you know? Maybe um, you see them freeing more people. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I'm not certain. You know, there's a million ways they could have gone. Um, but as you can tell, I've talked over an hour on a single film. It, it means I really like it or really hate it. Uh, in the case of the matrix, I really like it. I love the green tint that the matrix scenes have. It does offset the real world scenes, gives it that computer look. I was a big fan of this movie when it came out. I was so much a fan of the matrix that in late 1999, I bought my first DVD player. And I bought it because The Matrix was out on DVD and it had extras. And I was such a fan of this movie that I wanted every piece of information I could find about it. And you know what? That Matrix DVD was, I think it was twenty nine ninety nine. That was the going rate for DVDs at the time. And I bought the player, which was 300 So I spent $330 to go home and watch a single movie. You know, I also bought Austin Powers, but I really bought it for The Matrix. And part of the fun was buying a film on this new format. It looked like a CD, but it was a DVD. And it felt like the the only way to watch The Matrix was on new technology. A laser was going to read. I was going to enter The Matrix via my DVD player, my giant $300 DVD player. Um, and it was going to be crystal clear and it was going to have all these extras and I was so excited and that's a testament to how good the movie is is that I spent that kind of dough on it and wasn't it an interesting way to incorporate the Keanu Reeves whoa moment because unlike his other movies when Keanu says whoa the rest of the audience said whoa at the same time when Morpheus takes that leap you know the Matrix paved the way for clones like Equilibrium, crappy sequels, Reloaded, Revolutions. Um, it would take a few years for them to get toys. And I was excited about the toys. I initially bought all of the first series. They weren't by McFarlane. They were by another company. And I bought a bunch of those. And then I bought some of the McFarlanes when they got the license. Uh, but the McFarlane ones were more like 
plastic little statues than they were figures. The first ones were figures. Uh, the McFarland stuff is all just display statues, and there's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but you have to uh, you have to get that aesthetic. Um, and McFarland did make the um, the exoskeleton power loader thing from two and three, which. Uh, regardless of the movie's uh nonsense that's a really cool toy a really cool vehicle so i applaud all of that and i you know i applaud the wachowskis for making a movie as audacious as the matrix and they had restraint in it for a little bit because if you watch the movie you're also struck by how long some of the takes go on it's not a fast cut armageddon type movie and it really could have been that so I applaud those guys or guy and girl now for lengthening the shots for letting us soak it in before you cut away and letting us know the geography of the fights so that we know where the characters are, how they're relating to it, what the stakes are, what the powers are, what the weaknesses are. Everything is done right in this movie. You're never, once everything is revealed and it's put into motion, you, the audience know right away what's going on and in a movie that complicated that's a testament to really good writing filmmaking and editing you know what a great movie the matrix is it's a great movie that you can just put on any time and enjoy the heck out of it you know and there aren't a lot of movies like that um i love the rotary phone look i love the uh the cell phones with the sliding bottom you know they actually made those Look at them on eBay. They're like 300 bucks. You wouldn't use them. They're so outdated. But as a collectible, that's really cool that they made a phone from the film that you could use. You know, I dig all that. Uh, the Matrix has a lot to love. It has a great look. It has um, good music. Um, the aesthetics are just really different and, and vibrant. And it, it, it eclipsed Phantom Menace that year. You know, in a year that had so many good movies, The Matrix was way at the top with Fight Club. You know, 99 gave us Fight Club, Matrix, Phantom Menace, um, The Mummy. I mean, that nobody even remembers The Mummy, but when it came out in April, it was like, oh my God, this looks like another late summer movie that we're getting early. And Spy Who Shagged Me, and a whole host of really well done original movies. You know, some sequels, some new. And isn't that what makes a good movie season is a little bit of both, you know, not a lot of remakes. Uh, they don't have that so much anymore. Now it's all remakes, reboots, sequels, you name it. Um, but uh, The Matrix stands uh, very high on a peak as quality filmmaking. And you know what? The Wachowskis had trouble after that. The Matrix sequels aren't very good. V for Vendetta is okay, but it's not... It doesn't have the grandeur of Matrix, and it is about a terrorist uh, blowing up London, even though it's a totalitarian, totalitarian state, right? But uh, look at uh, the trailers for the Will It Ever Get Released Jupiter Ascending. I mean, that movie looks like a mess. Oh, my God. If that movie's good, I will be impressed because it looks like a mess. But hey... A lot of movies look like a mess and come out great. So I'm hoping that it is because I do trust the Wachowskis. Um, sorry, Andy. I'm not a fan of Speed Racer. I know you really love that movie. Uh, again, I think it's like Tron Legacy. It's one of those movies that I need to revisit. So I will. I will revisit it. I will watch both um, Tron Legacy and Speed Racer, and I'll give you a second opinion on it. Uh, I will scrutinize it the way I scrutinize these movies. And I will talk and talk and talk and figure out what's good and what's bad. And you'll get my opinion either, you know, you respect it or you don't. I, you know, I, I'm just uh, putting it on digital for you to enjoy. And I needed to, um, I needed to do a big movie one because I haven't done one in a couple episodes. Uh, I'll try to balance it. I still have, like I said, more uh, more Don Berg stories to tell about the guy that ruined my teenage years. There's still drunk stories to tell. Uh, I was just uh, talking with a guy, Jeff, who worked trapped with me all Halloween. And we used to do improv 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. And David Carrero, who uh, 
who I know from improv days, we're going to sit and do that improv episode and it's going to be fun because those were crazy days and we did a lot of insane stuff. Uh, there are tons of episodes to go. I think this is episode 20. Um, I'm as proud as can be that I've kept this up even during not scary farm where I'm dead on my feet. Uh, I'm ecstatic and humbled by the uh, numbers of downloads that I'm getting all across the world. I think every, each and every one of you for, listening to my nonsense and enjoying the podcast and interacting with me on Twitter. I was up all night last night with Rick West from themeparkadventure.com. He was reminiscing with me about the fair lane episode. Cause I went into a little bit about, uh, uh, Sam Kinison and uh, Sam Kinison was a real big part of my teenage years. What a, what a talent gone too soon. Um, but, uh, that's very cool. And I love talking episodes with people. It's it's a lot of fun to hear people's take on all this craziness. But uh, uh, go watch The Matrix. Go enjoy it and look at it with new eyes. And uh, you'll find a, a lot to like right you know under the surface. Uh, and it made me want to watch Fight Club and uh, Game. Have you ever seen The Game with Michael Douglas? It's the Fincher movie. Fantastic movie. Um, but uh, we'll get to all those. Uh, there's no rush. No rush at all, because um, we'll talk until my voice ends. And boy, is it dying right now. So uh, thanks for listening. If you want to interact with me, you can find 91 Reasons on Facebook. You can also find my personal Facebook page. I'm Jeff Tucker on Facebook. Um, on Twitter, I am at the sixth key, all spelled out, S-I-X-T-H, T-H-E-S-I-X-T-H-K-E-Y. And uh, you can also go to iTunes and leave me a review. That would be fantastic. Uh, you can buy my books on Amazon.com. The Sixth Key, The Lost Station, and The Infinite Backward, all available in paperback or as a Kindle download for 99 cents. If you're an Amazon Prime member, they're free. What a deal. And I'm hard at work on book four, The Ice Temple. It'll be out next year. Uh, we're already gearing up for WonderCon, which is in uh, April of next year. So we'll be there. I'll be selling the copies of my book. And if you want to talk 91 Reasons, uh, that's what we're there for. Fantastic. Shout out to my friend Chris Gore. Uh, he has a podcast, Pod Crash, with that Chris Gore. He hasn't done an episode in a while, but that's okay. Because you can go on iTunes and look at all his previous episodes and be highly entertained. He is a very talented guy. It was cool running through Infected, the zombie killing attraction at Not Scary Farm and killing zombies. Uh, I had a fantastic time at Not Scary Farm. Thanks for everybody who came out and said hi at Trapped. Uh, have I thanked everybody enough? I have. I, my voice is dying. Dying, I tell you. And it won't come back in a Matrix way because I am not the one. I am simply Jeff Tucker, and this is 91 Reasons. Thanks for listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Is anyone even still listening?